The Society for Vascular Surgery, under the leadership of Richard Cambria and Peter Glavitsky, has initiated audiovisual interviews with pioneers of vascular surgery. This is part of an effort by SVS to develop archives to preserve the history of SVS as well as vascular surgery as a specialty. A committee was formed called the History Project Work Group, chaired by Jimmy Yao with Norman Rich and myself as committee members. Because of the workload, an expansion of the committee was needed. Bill Baker, Mark Escondary, Walt McCarthy, William Pierce, Melina Kibbe, and Peter Lawrence were added. Since September 2011, we have interviewed some 50 leaders. SVS has also recommended that these interviews be extended to honorary members as well. Today, we're fortunate to interview the legendary surgeon and leader and educator, Dr. Frank Veith. Thank you, Frank, for agreeing to this interview. Pleasure to be here. Every story has a beginning. So let's start with your beginning, your early years in New York. I was just an ordinary uh, child, I guess, uh, no brothers and sisters, of an Irish mother and a father who was of German extraction. And I went to public school and then to a private high school and um, then to Cornell. Well, let's, let's back up for a minute now. Tell me about the uh, grandfather who was the German businessman. Yeah, I had a, a uh, interesting grandfather right. who I never met, who was, uh, came over as a 14-year-old boy, uh, basically an orphan without parents. Uh, his parents may have been alive, but were back in Germany. And uh, he started a business, uh, import-export uh, business, with regard to sequins. Yes. Uh, and he became very wealthy and, and very successful because of the um, thrust towards the sequins in the 1920s. He became very wealthy, and then his half-brother uh, managed to steal the business from him, so he became less wealthy which is why I had to work. You've spoken about your public school for your grammar school education and high school in Riverdale. What was Frank Veith interested in in those days? <laughs> I, I can't remember, mostly sports and uh, not very interested in school. Um, I really don't have, I was interested in my friends and having a good time, I suppose, but uh, not very school oriented. <clears throat> you weren't exactly academically oriented at that point. Not at all. But you went to Cornell in, in 1952. I graduated in 1952. Okay. 1948 was when I went there. Okay. And um, I, there was nothing distinguishing about my career in, in college. I. But wait a minute, now you you're minimizing that you you graduated with honors and were 5'8". Yeah, I, I actually did well in college because I probably was terrified of not doing well, and so I studied a lot and, and got good grades, yes. Now, why did you decide to do Madison? Uh, it, it's hard to pick a reason. Uh, my mother had been a nurse, and she'd always pushed me towards medicine. I had an uncle who was a dentist, and he had pushed me towards surgery, uh, at least having some interest in it uh, or encouraged me to take my father was a lawyer and I knew I didn't want to do law because he was always coming home at night and having to work on paperwork, paperwork <laughs> which I didn't particularly want to ever do I wanted to work with my hands or my head and it turns out obviously uh, in academics I was doing the same thing that he did coming home at night and dealing with paperwork yeah after three years, you were able to go to medical school. Went to medical school. I w actually went to Cornell because I had gotten a, a full scholarship from New York State. I was accepted to Harvard Medical School also, and I think probably made the wrong decision in not going there. Um, but I did go to Cornell, and that worked out pretty well, too. Now, why did you decide on surgery now. You said the, the dentist uncle encouraged you, but 
No, that wasn't the reason. I, I was always interested in, in the intellectual part of medicine uh, and, and was thinking very seriously of, of uh, internal medicine. Mm. Uh, and uh, because it was intellectually challenging. And then I had this one experience <coughs> where I took care of a patient with a, as a medical student with a perforated ulcer, made the diagnosis, went to the operating room, saw, saw the procedure completed, uh, successfully saw the patient get well and that convinced me that I would be more inclined to be in, engaged in especially where there was active participation and where you could see the results quickly of what you did and that got me into surgery plus we had a uh, animal surgery laboratory where I realized I could do the procedures and, and that also prompted me to go into surgery. And you finished medical school as number one in your class. Yes, I did. So when you say you weren't doing that well academically, that's a little modest, right? You well, were doing very well. I, I guess I did okay, but again, it was mostly <laughs> fear rather than intellect that, that prompted me to work hard and, and uh, get good grades. So you went to internship now again in New York. I went in Columbia Presbyterian. Um, I was torn between <clears> going to one of the Harvard hospitals in Columbia, and I actually probably could have gotten into either, um, but I chose New York, I guess, because um, I wanted to stay close to my family, which was probably a very stupid thing to do. It was a bad reason for choosing it. But now, after your internship, now you do go to Boston. Yeah, I, I had a very planned deferment right. from the Army, and um, Columbia wanted me to go in the Army after my internship year, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be trained and then go into the Army. So I applied for and, and got into the Brigham, which had been my first choice if I had right. gone to Boston. Now, you did go into the military, though, in 1960. Yeah, after I was pretty closely trained, per pretty fully trained. I, I was board eligible, but I had not finished my chief resident year at the Brigham. Was this time well spent or was this wasted Army? time? Yes. The Army was outstanding. I mean, I was the chief of surgery at Fort Carson uh, Military Hospital, which was a fairly big hospital serving Colorado Springs, oh. the Air Force Academy, etc. And so I d did more surgery at Fort Carson after I built up the confidence of the hospital commander than I had done probably throughout my whole residency and actually became uh, consultant in pediatric surgery for the Fifth Army area and stuff like that. So I, it was a very positive experience surgically, and it was also a nice place to be. When you finished your military obligation, you went back to, to um, Peter Bent Brigham. I did. And finished as a chief resident there. Correct. Why were you so drawn to Harvard? Why not stay well, the, in New there York was a the guy named uh, the head of surgery at the Peter Ben Brigham was a fellow named Francis Moore, right. who was an awesome uh, individual Absolutely. in many ways, the preeminent surgeon in the world at that time, yes. and um, that was a huge draw because of what he did and what he meant and so forth, and um, I just felt it was the best place to get trained. And he had trained David Hume. Trained David Hume. He, he, he was an awesome guy. He was an excellent surgeon. He was a, a brilliant intellect. Many of his colleagues and contemporaries didn't think he was a good surgeon, which was nonsense. He was a, a brilliant surgeon. He was, did m most operations he did beautifully and, and was an inspiration. He was good at everything he did. Now, in 1963 through 64, you did a postdoctorate fellowship at Harvard Medical School. Doing what? What was that all about? Was well, that when I, you got the Markell scholarship? No, I got it after that. Okay. But but the um, every resident that went through the Brigham program had done some research, and I managed to get through without having spent any time in the laboratory. And I really I'd had one or two publications, um, maybe three or four, but I really hadn't done basic surgical research. So I decided after finishing my training that I did 
probably want to pursue an academic career, and I felt that I should spend a year in the lab. And I spent it with Joe Murray as my oh. um, instructor or, or guide, uh, and I did work both in liver transplant and skin transplantation. And, and he was my mentor, as it were, and very fond of Joe Murray in many ways. And uh, that was a good year, too. I mean, I got a lot out of it. We got some publications, and uh, I got introduced to the academic milieu presenting some of this work at the Surgical Forum and stuff like that. Now you've completely finished your training, <clears throat> and you decide to go into practice. Why academics? Because I guess I had done well academically. Um, the people that I aspired to be like, Francis Moore, Joe Murray, Chilton Crane, John Brooks, these were all surgeons who I respected a lot. They all were academically oriented, and they encouraged us to do the same. But I did think of going into private practice, but basically I thought that it would be better for me, a better fit, to uh, remain academically intensely affiliated. So pursue an academic career. To pursue an academic career, you went back to New York in 1960. Yeah, I would have liked to have stayed at Boston, uh, but there were no jobs at that point. Uh, being chief resident at the Brigham was a unique experience because the second most powerful guy in the institution was the chief resident, more powerful than any of the other, um, more responsibility, power, et cetera, authority than any of the other attendings. And I think Dr. Moore probably structured it that way yeah. because you were sort of a semi-god for a year. And when that year ended, nothing. And, and so there was no second in command, really, at the Brigham. The chief resident was the second in command administratively. And it was a great experience. But it also was a bit of a letdown when it was over. Bigger letdown yet when you decided to go back to New York. Uh, well, as I say, I would have liked to have stayed at the Brigham, uh, but it was a small hospital in those days. There was no job, and uh, although I, there were some ancillary jobs in, in Boston, I, I felt that a better academic opportunity was with the Cornell service at Bellevue. What did you find there, Frank? It was a hellhole <laughs> in many ways. Uh, it was a good experience in some ways. I mean, I managed to get an NIH grant and um, do, continue to do some research, but as far as doing clinical surgery, it was, for me, it was, it was not much of a job. The surgery you were doing then was general surgery, right? Well, it was general surgery and, and whatever vascular I could get my hands on, uh, because vascular surgery was a part of general surgery right. in those days. In 1967, then, you moved to Albert Einstein and I did. Montefiore. I, I was forced to move because Cornell and New York City got a divorce, and Cornell was either forced or elected to leave Bellevue. So the service that I was affiliated with um, was no more. And though I could have stayed at Cornell, it really was not a particularly hospitable uh, opportunity. So I went to the Bronx, to Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Montefiore Medical Center, with every intention of leaving soon to get a better job. But it turned out Montefiore was, at that time, was, was pretty good, yeah. um, and, and I stayed. During this same time frame, you became co-director of the transplant unit. What in the world was that about? Well, I, I was basically director of the transplant unit. Marv Gleedman, who was the chief of service, who really didn't know a lot about transplantation was the other co-director, but I really basically built it and ran it. And I'd learned how to do kidney transplants from Murray and, and some of the other surgeons at the Brigham, and I learned how to take care of them, so I started the transplant service there. And, and it was a successful kidney transplant service. And let's stop right there for a moment. You did pioneering work in clinical lung, lung transplant. What was that about? Well. What? Kidney transplantation was pretty well established. 
I mean, it had its frustrations and, and problems with poor immunosuppression and so forth, but the one area of opportunity where really no clinical success or even laboratory success had been accomplished was lung transplantation. Right. It was a large organ, had vascular anastomoses. Um, it was in many ways frustrating and unexplored, so I thought that I would embark on that particular area because it represented an area of opportunity in which no clinical successes had been achieved. Now, who taught you about how to do this? I taught myself, obviously. I mean, I, I read and and we, it wasn't just clinical. I mean, we did a lot of animal work as well. And over the years, I, got, I was successful in, in getting NIH grants, a program project, and so forth, all designed to um, solve the problems that prevented lung transplantation from becoming a clinical reality. And during the course of that, we did, I think, eight or nine uh, clinical lung transplants, single lung transplants. That were successful? Well, one or two of them were, were quite successful. They weren't perfect. They weren't long-term survivors. One patient survived for six months. This was before cyclosporin. Um, and the thing that we did is we proved conclusively both in animals and in man that a single lung could provide total pulmonary function for the patient under appropriate circumstances and if rejection could be prevented. And we proved that first in the animals proved why others hadn't been able to do it, showed why they couldn't do it, showed how to correct that problem, and then took that to the, to the bedside and did patients that really had no function in their other lung. And this one particular patient that we did was, was really quite successful in, in documenting that an emphysematous patient with pulmonary hypertension could be um, basically cured with a single lung transplant. Wow. In the 70s and 80s, you redirected your attention, this time to vascular surgery. Why was that? Well, well, I never really redirected it because I was always interested in vascular, but my research interest was in lung transplantation. And um, I realized there were, there were lots of problems getting donors in New York City. The other hospitals weren't particularly cooperative, although they would accept organ donation for what they were interested in, typically heart transplantation, they wouldn't share their donor lungs with us. And I realized that I couldn't make a living doing lung transplants, even though I thought we could make them work. Um, and I also realized that I still liked doing clinical surgery. And so I basically had two careers going at the same time, one in a research area, the lungs, and the other clinical vascular surgery. And I gradually moved more and more into vascular surgery because of the challenge that that presented and because of the fact that it allowed me to take care of lots of patients. By 1971, you were now a full professor at Einstein, and by 1972, you were chief of vascular surgery at Montefiore. Right. So you had rapidly moved up the academic ladder. Yeah, that went pretty well. But remember, it was <clears throat> not the first-rate hospital that some of the other institutions in New York uh, were, and so it was easier to move up quickly in that somewhat disadvantaged environment. Currently, Frank, you're now the professor of surgery and the von Liebig chair in vascular surgery at Cleveland Clinic. How were you able to move that? The last time I checked, Cleveland was not in New York. No, no. How did you move? Well, a actually, my current appointments are at N NYU in New York, where I have a professorial appointment, and right. where I do my limited clinical work at present, see patients, operate a little bit here and there. Uh, and as you, I know, know, I, we run a big meeting, uh, vascular gonna, meeting, which... We don't come back to that. Which basically... When I left Montefiore, I needed a sponsor, right. both from the CME point of view and from a financial point of view, and so I affiliated with the Cleveland Clinic, uh, and that is the basis for my Cleveland Clinic appointment. I did go there and do some limited clinical work at the beginning, but really I don't do anything there at present. But you were able to transfer the 
or maintained the, the von Liebig chair when you left Montefiore. You took that with you. It's an interesting story. No, yes. I didn't take it with me. Um, Montefiore actually, although the chair was given to me in perpetuity by contract till I was no longer active, uh, they didn't see it that way. And uh, they managed to take the chair. So I called up the Liebig Foundation and I got a second chair, but the money was kept by Montefiore which was actually, I was told by attorneys, actionable, but I chose not to take any legal action. Frank, you've also been involved in numerous important committees, editorial boards, including the journal. During this time, you mentioned Franny Moore as a mentor. Mm -hmm. You had other mentors. Absolutely, sure. Dwight Harkin was was who's a cardiac surgeon of considerable renown, also at the Brigham. Um, he was a, very much a mentor. I patterned my clinical work um, on the way he ran his service. In other words, giving residents a great deal of responsibility, both in and out of the operating room, um, making them partners in in many ways in, mm -hmm. in a big clinical effort. <clears throat> so I, I basically followed his pattern of, of setting up a clinical service, and it worked. It worked very well for me. What, who are the... Well, Chilton Crane and, and Richard Warren were the vascular surgeons at the Brigham. If They were general surgeons, but with an interest in, in vascular surgery. They were very influential. Chilton Crane, particularly in my case, although Richard Warren, I guess, equally so. Um, John Brooks, again, another individual who's no longer with us, uh, was very influential. He was a first-rate academic and clinical surgeon. And another fellow who was really uh, my chief resident when I was a senior resident, Richard Wilson, also a very fine general surgeon, was a friend and a, and a mentor. I think it's safe to say that you have received massive awards and recognition, not the least of which was in, in 2010, you received the SVS Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award. You've led every significant surgical organization in the country. You have a staggering number of publications, some 744 by last count, and a large number of book and book chapters, 339. The list goes on and on. How did this all happen to this young man from New York City? Well, I had a lot of good partners. And uh, I, we, again, following the leadership of some of my Brigham mentors, I structured my service in a way that um, it was really a, more of a partnership between equals than it was an autocratic, um, typical surgical service. And I obviously was very interested in publishing the work that we did. It was a very important part of um, making our work known, getting support, and so forth. So I encouraged my partners to uh, write lots of articles, and I shared the authorship in, in many cases with them, and sometimes I'd write the articles and they'd still be the first author if they were the leader in that particular work. And uh, we did a lot of stuff in vascular surgery that nobody else had deemed possible um, over many years, a many year period. And so a lot of that stuff gave rise to, um, to good articles. And, um, and we, if we had the material, we wrote them. Um, and of course, when we started doing endovascular, every case was unique and um, every group of cases were uh, suitable for writing articles. With all this success, when you look back, do you have tips? Do you have specifics about time management, for example? No, I, I, basically it's, it's persistence and hard work. I mean, the writing usually had to be done at night or on weekends, and um, other activities sometimes had to be sacrificed. And, and uh, so, as I say, persistence and hard work usually um, 
I mean, the papers don't always get accepted, even if they're good or about a good topic, and they require rewriting, editing, and often submission to another even better journal than the one that sometimes rejected it. Some of our best work was rejected um, because people didn't believe it. And uh, by persisting and, and, as I say, sometimes sending it to a better journal, we usually got it published sooner or later. Despite all this wild success, did you have any failures, Frank? Lots of failures. Um, I mean, clinical failures. I mean, cases that we thought we could have a yeah. chance at doing that, that didn't turn out to be successful. But my biggest failure was um, the inability to make vascular surgery succeed in attaining um, specialty status, real specialty status, as an independent specialty rather than a subspecialty. We'll talk some more about that mm -hmm. shortly. What lessons did you learn from failure? Uh, what lessons? Uh, well, Tough to question. try something else. I mean, if something fails, first of all, you have to be very persistent. And uh, <coughs> just to, to go back to the board situation, I was enormously persistent yes, and committed to it for many years, but when it failed and it was obvious to me that it wasn't going to succeed, probably for a, a lot of bad reasons, uh, I basically said to myself, you have to walk away and do something else. And uh, that's basically what I did. And so I think that failure is part of life, it's certainly part of yes. vascular surgery. Oh, yes. And uh, you can have a failure that by persistence you can uh, turn into a success. But in the case with the, the board situation, it was, I thought, was hopeless, and, and so we turned our attention to other things. Change gears for a moment and, and talk about your immediate family, Frank. To tell us about your children and... Well, I have four children uh, and 12 grandchildren, mm. um, and uh, my relationship with my kids it probably suffered uh, somewhat from the fact that I was always working. Um, and probably suffered from the fact I didn't pay as much attention to them as I might, but I have a better relationship at least with most of my grandchildren, and uh, I probably have more time that I can at least think about them and, and try to be supportive. So I, I think that, that uh, everything has a price, and, and some of the what you call success, I call it hard work, um, obviously has, has a price. Any lawyers in the, in the family? Two or? sons are lawyers, um, and my two daughters are, are basically, they work, but they are, they're not career women. No, no MDs? No MDs. Perhaps some of the grandchildren will go in that direction. I don't know yet. Frank, I'd like to go back and spend some more time in particular areas, focus areas of interest. The first being to talk about your pioneering work in limb salvage for severely ischemic legs. You entered this arena when amputation was a frequent outcome. How and why did you engage? Okay, that's, that's a very interesting question. Yeah. Again, you don't realize it at the time, but when I went to Montefiore, which was a poor hospital with lots of indigent, um, disadvantaged patients, um, I, of course, wanted to do aneurysms and carotids like every other vascular surgeon was doing and writing about, and we didn't have many of those cases. But we did have a lot of people that had gangrenous limbs, uh, super abundance. And because I was not, because I recognized that the standard treatment for these patients was just to take off their legs, either above or below the knee, I said, maybe we should try to save some of these legs. And we had extremely good angiography. Mm -hmm. um, largely, well, I, I was involved in that too. The surgeons were doing their own angiograms and they weren't so good. So I made sure, it was probably a mistake at the time, but I made sure <laughs> that I got the interventional radiologist that was working with us to do all the angiograms. And he became extremely proficient because he was doing them all. So we had super angiography where we could see the little vessels in the lower leg and foot 
no other institution was getting that. And um, when I'd see a vessel, I started to try to do some bypasses to these vessels. This was before anybody was attempting limb salvage below, much below the knee. There were a few case reports, but nobody. And, uh, and some of these procedures worked. So when they worked, we did more and more of them. And again, with the good angiography, we started to get patients from other hospitals that were deemed inoperable because they didn't visualize the foot and the ankle. And we'd find a nice big fat vessel in the foot or at the ankle and we'd do a bypass to it, first with vein, and when we ran out of vein, we used prosthetics. And remarkably, these procedures worked better than anybody could imagine, even when there was extensive gangrene. And we'd show pictures of these cases and people wouldn't believe us. they say, you can't do that, you're lying, da 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 da. So we collected series of these cases and documented them and had people come and look at the, you know, see us do the case and, and see the patients afterwards and so forth. And it became apparent that this stuff could be done and it did work. Even when I didn't think it could work, remarkably bypasses to very little vessels in the foot and at the ankle could work and did work. And they, they persisted and they allowed the foot to be salvaged even if you had to take off all the toes or the heel or whatever. So we collected more and more of these cases and, and kept writing about them and showing them. And ultimately, it, after 10 years of being regarded as a maverick, crazy person, a radical, as John Manick would say, um, <laughs> people started to believe it and, and duplicate it. Not everybody could duplicate it, but commitment was a very important part. And I had partners and fellows and residents. And with those, the resources that they provided, wasn't just me. We all could do this. So we, we you know, must have taken care of 4,000 or more patients over the years with, with true ischemic gangrene or ulceration, not trivial gangrene, big, big league stuff. And with a bi and then we started using angioplasty very early because I was, again, supporting our radiologist. I sent him out to, we had daughter come to the New York Surgical when I was president. I invited daughter to come. Nobody believed him. They all thought he was crazy, footprints in the snow. But I said, maybe this guy is telling the truth. And I sent our radiologist out to observe him and, and start doing angioplasty. And he went out there, spent a week, and came back, and we started doing angioplasty before there were balloons. And they worked. And in these old, sick patients with dead legs or dead feet, much easier to do an angioplasty of the iliac if they had multilevel disease than to do an aortobifemoral bypass. So we started doing them uh, routinely. And I think we published er very early on, in the late 70s or early 80s, that angioplasty did work. But and how can this work, Frank? How? It, it just did. It's, I mean, how can you put these metal stents, metal cages, inside a blood vessel? We, we didn't have metal cages. These were Van Andel catheters. They were just tapered catheters that would stick over a guide wire through the plaque dilate it, improve the flow, and then about three years after we started doing that, the balloon catheters were introduced. But how can you mash plaques, mash them and crush them, and how can and expect this to work? I know it does work, but well, how do you rationalize We now know how it works. Well, first of all, what Daughter said wasn't true. It wasn't that the, the, wasn't the footprint in the snow where the plaque was compressed against the wall what was happening was the normal adventitia of the artery was being dilated. Right. So the lumen was actually increased. And then when stent, of course, there were dissections. And we didn't think it was going to work either because in the operating room with dilators, it doesn't work. But in the setting of, of the angiography with guide wires and um, sheaths and stuff like that, it does work. And, but sometimes it didn't work because there was a dissection and it would thrombose. But with stents, when they came along, immediately we embraced those and they did work. We would, would plaster the dissection up against the wall of the artery. So, it, it, again, I didn't really think it was going to work, just like with the lung transplant, because the literature said it couldn't work. A denervated lung had high resistance, so you couldn't transplant a lung in a patient with pulmonary hypertension. But we showed that the resistance was at the anastomosis 
the arterial anastomosis, the artery dilated, became a point of relative constriction. So if we eliminated that constriction, the resistance was normal in the rest of the lung. Um, and we documented that. that. That was an article in Science. But similarly, with the angioplasty, I didn't think it was going to work either. But it did. And as it worked, we did more and more. And then we started to do angioplasties of the SFA when we had appropriate lesions. As the technology improved, we realized we could do more. But I would not do the angioplasties. I would refer them to our radiologist to do. Mistake. But I, that's how we did it. Bad mistake. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the first United States graph, stent graph, done with Juan Perotti. Can you expand on that and tell sure. us about that case? Well, I'll tell you a little bit of the background because <clears throat> we just had the 20-year uh, yeah. anniversary at, at our meeting where Juan and Claudio Schoenholz and Mike Marin and I were celebrated for doing it. But what happened, um, I used, because I'd supported Barry Katzen early in his career. When he was through his training, I, I invited him just out of his training to talk at the New York Cardiovascular, I guess when I was the president, because I thought maybe there was some interest in, or some merit in, in um, uh, lytic drugs, which he was proposing. So I invited him to speak at that, on that at our uh, New York Cardiovascular, and uh, he never forgot that. So he would invite me to his meeting, his radiology meeting in Miami, um, and I would go and I would listen, and I would hear the interventional point of view, which no vascular surgeon would accept. This was in the mid-80s, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I realized that maybe there was more to this than met the eye. And we were doing angioplasties, too, when no other surgeon embraced it. They were, they were all against it. Um, and they were working. And I think it was in 1987, I saw Julio Palmez talk on stents, and he talked about stent grafts for treatment of aneurysms, and he showed some pictures. And I was very interested in that. And then, subsequently, I didn't do any research work on it or start any laboratory or animal investigation, but I was interested in it because of my uh, positive experience with angioplasty. And um, so then I saw Perotti's article, and um, I, um, we talked about, uh, about doing it at that time, that maybe there was something to it. And again, most surgeons were very negative about it. Um, and then um, we had a patient in 1992, the summer of 1992. The patient was referred to me with a big tender aneurysm, very bad risk, and Mike Marin called me up and, uh, on a weekend and, and said, we have this patient, what are we going to do? Maybe we should go down and see Perotti and see how he does it and learn how to do it and come back and do this patient. And I thought about it for like two minutes. And I said, that's a great idea. I have the money. Somebody had just given us some, some uh, a, a grant. Um, and uh, I said, let's go down there. And so Perotti knew me. So I called him up and I invited him to our meeting. And I said, by the way, we have this patient. Can we come down and see, show us how to do this? We'll take it back and, and do it on the sick patient in the Bronx. We'll bring our x-rays, etc. And he says, well, I'm not doing any more patients right now. So I said, well, maybe you'd like to come up and do the procedure here. And he said, ah, maybe I'll come to your meeting. He wasn't very positive about it, but we pursued it. And we sent him the films. They got lost. We sent another set. Um, and then ultimately, he and Marin met in Milwaukee at a cardiology meeting, and they hit it off. And by this time, I developed a relationship with Perotti on the telephone. He was coming to our meeting, so we persuaded him with a lot of, there was a lot of adversity. There was, a, you know, obstacles all the way. Uh, the biggest one being J&J &J wasn't going to let us use a palm as stent because they were worried about the, uh, that impacting on their cardiac stent, coronary stent, the palm as shats. And, and Perotti had signed an agreement that he was uh, locked in with J&J. &J. So anyhow, we kept overcoming the obstacles. We brought his radiologist, his instrument guy, 
um, agreed to do all that, fly them first class, put them up in a hotel in New York, et cetera, et cetera. And after the meeting, we were going to do this case of ours. And so we talked about this last week at the, at when we had this, this celebration for the 20th anniversary. So anyhow, Marin and I took the president of J&J &J Interventional, now Cordis, out to dinner with his, one of his colleagues at the Newark Marriott, and they kept saying, no, 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 no. And Marin and I, they were sitting at a table in the corner, and they were in the corner. We wouldn't let them out of the corner for like four hours, and the restaurant was closing, and the chairs were on the tables and everything, and finally they got so tired, they said, do whatever you want, we don't care. And so we overcame that obstacle. We got Perotti to come. He came to the Bronx and saw what you know, awful instrumentation and stuff we had there. We had a borrowed portable um, fluoroscope that cardiology had thrown out and uh, very primitive. So Perotti said to Schoenhaus, we got to leave. This, this place is much worse than it is in Argentina. <laughs> it's the fourth world. We're going back to Argentina. But we persuaded them to stay and we did the case and, and it came out pretty well. Did he do the case, Frank? Well, we, we helped. I mean, we did parts of it, but I mean, he basically and Schoenholz did all the catheter wire work. But the interesting part of that case is when I saw it, I said to myself, I mean, it was like a lightning bolt. I said, if vascular surgeons aren't doing this, we're out of the game. And um, so it was, it was really a seminal event for me. Right. Um, like you and, and it turned out that I was increasingly important in, in some societies, including the SVS, in the next three or four years. So after that case, we, we had him come up to do three other cases, two of which, one of which ended badly, uh, one ended sort of neutrally, and one was positive. Um, but it wasn't all the first case was. I mean, it was, we saw that there were problems, or there could be problems, but we pursued it. We started making the grafts ourselves, Marin and I, and um, we were the only two that could make them, and we made them from Palmez stents, some of which were commercially available at the time, or we bought the stents from, from Argentina, so we did a bunch more cases, and they worked. We used it for occlusive disease, for trauma, we used it for everything, and, and, and for aneurysms, and they worked. And so we went to present this to our colleagues. There was a vascular surgery biology club. And I brought Perotti and Marin, and I gave the presentation. I guess Jerry Goldstone was running the thing, and he said, we already have a presentation. Jack Cronenwet is giving an hour's talk on uh, co-culturing smooth muscle cells and, and uh, endothelial cells. So you can wait until next year. And I said, Jerry. This is important stuff. Everybody ought to know about it because it's going to change the way you do stuff. And he says, oh, the hell with it. We'll give you 10 minutes. I'm just the secretary. You do what you want because I kept persisting. So I got 10 minutes to present this at the Vascular Surgery Biology Club with all the then leaders at the time. And I thought I was going to be greeted like a hero. You know, we had 25 cases. I had Perotti sitting in the audience, Marin sitting in the audience. We couldn't, three of us, be lying. So we presented these 25 or 30 cases. And nobody in the audience believed us. Chris Ahrens didn't believe us. Wes Moore didn't believe us. Jimmy Yao didn't believe us. Um, Jim Stanley, my good friend, didn't believe us. Um, I don't think Bob Rutherford, nobody believed us. And, and certainly John Porter was very derogatory. <laughs> and he said, you're lying. I can't and he says, that. if you're not lying, you shouldn't be doing this stuff. So I got very depressed, and um, we went out, we had a beer, the three of us, and, and Perotti says, that's exactly how I was treated in Argentina. And uh, so we, ca and, and we sent a paper into the SVS. It didn't even make the cut. They, they rejected it, you know, in the, the dregs. Um, and, and so um, we kept at it, and obviously it kept working. And then I gave a presidential address at the Eastern Vascular in 1994, and I made that the topic of the address. And I said, if you guys don't learn this stuff, you're, gonna, you're out of business. And then two years later, I, was, I gave my presidential address at the SVS, 
on Charles Darwin and vascular surgery, right. and I had three points. One was, if you don't become endovascular competent, you're, you're going to become extinct. Secondly, um, we had to become an independent specialty because this would define us and separate us from cardiac and general surgery. And thirdly, we had to form centers with the interventional radiologists so that we could learn from them and support them. And tongue-in-cheek, I was concerned that it would, would give us protection as vascular surgeons against cardiologists who were then becoming more active in this area. I was wrong about the centers. Uh, they didn't work too well. I was right about the board and independence, but I, we lost that fight. But now, as you know, endo is it's nine-tenths of every SVS meeting, and it it's, fills the journals. I mean, there, nobody's interested in instruments and open operations anymore. Tell us about doing the first ruptured aneurysm using the endograph. It was a natural. I mean, we, we had, we made our own graft, and it was sterile. Marin would run it down to the, the gas sterilizer. We'd make it, you'd take it down there, and you'd come back with one or two of these grafts, which took a couple hours more to make. And so we had a stock of them. And we, we kept saying, if we have a ruptured aneurysm, we should do this, because we did, we did terribly with ruptured aneurysms. We had about a 70% mortality because of the nature of our population. Even though we thought we did the operation very well, I used to write about it and all, and how to make the diagnosis, or it didn't matter, they still died. So uh, we had a patient that was inoperable with ostomies and scars and hernias and terrible heart, and so, and a ruptured aorta. So we did this fellow, and he got better. He lived for, I think the first guy lived for three years or something. Now, I can't did, remember, but, but he got better immediately. How did you know that you had an adequate neck? I think we did an angiogram. We, we, we were doing, I guess we had CAT scan and angio on the first okay. patient. And uh, we, would, we wouldn't get CAT scans on everybody because our CAT scan... Uh, accessibility right. was poor. Logistics are the logistics difficult. were terrible. So we would we got so we would just once we had a ruptured aneurysm we'd do everything angiographically okay. with measuring catheters, and if we had any neck we we did it. If we didn't we opened them. With more vascular cases being done using endovascular techniques, open cases are certainly on the decline as you've mentioned. Is this a problem for training in your mind? A terrible problem. Right. Well, because the you have to do, for example, distal bypasses. I think you have to do 50 to 100 to be competent. I, our residents don't do that many. They're lucky if they do 10. Um, and it, it just, it's not an area of excitement and interest anymore. There's still some people that are very capable, that are well-trained and can do them, but many surgeons can't do them well. Many surgeons could never do them well. You know, the vascular surgeons, many guys... They didn't have the patience and, and the commitment. Some of these cases used to take me eight or nine hours, particularly a redo. And then after you're all done and you get an angiogram and it's not perfect, you got another three hours to fix it if you can. But that was part of it. And so the, the procedures were, were, are long and tedious, whereas endo, if it works, is quicker, but still can be tedious. The very distal endo cases are, are hard now, too. Well, with the dominance of endovascular, certainly fewer general surgeons are trying to do vascular surgery now, which perhaps is a good thing. Uh, it's a good thing for the patients. Right. And uh, they still do fistulas and veins and amputations, which I think is a bad thing for all concerned. But um, I think we should have enough vascular surgeons to do all vascular cases. And I think an amputation... If it's done by a general surgeon, he's not going to know whether or not that patient can have a successful salvage of the limb, um, and he'll do the amputation. Um, but now our competition comes from um, cardiology, interventional cardiology, a little bit from interventional radiology, although I think that's, that's not threatening in any way, and um, from cardiac surgery. I see cardiac surgeons who don't have enough to do in the heart, who are 
becoming more and more interested in doing renal angioplasty, carotid angioplasty, mm -hmm. leg angioplasty, and certainly abdominal aneurysm and thoracic aneurysms. Mm -hmm. And they can learn. Frank, speaking of the training in vascular surgery, discuss for a moment the Zero Five training program for vascular surgery. What are your thoughts there? I think it's a positive. I mean, I think that's yeah. the only way to go. As I, I still go to our general surgery conferences at NYU, and I find them interesting, but I'm a civilian there. I don't know anything about what general, you know, I know very little about general surgery <clears throat> today. I certainly don't understand the procedures that they do. It's all done laparoscopically. Uh, now a lot of the, the cases are done for, for weight loss surgery, which is totally beyond me. I don't know any of the facts or anything like that. Um, it's a different specialty, and we're a different specialty. Yes. And, and so I think a zero and five is a natural. Whatever general surgery techniques the vascular surgeon has to learn, can be learned by attaching him to a general surgery service. So he learns how to do laparotomies, thoracotomies, and so forth. Um, but I think it's, it's a waste of our valuable training years to learn how to do adrenalectomies or uh, breast surgery or um, thyroid surgery for that matter. We should focus on what we're doing and expected to do well, and there's plenty of it to fill five years, oh, yes. we have to learn imaging, uh, we have to learn non-invasive and, and invasive diagnosis, we certainly have to learn open and endo uh, surgery, and we have to learn how to take care of the patients, and we should learn medical treatment. And all that will fill up five years very easily. So I think it's a huge advance. I think the five and two is, is sort of a, I don't know, there's a word, it's, it's a throwback to historical throwback and, and probably there are very few vascular surgeons that are going to be asked to do a lot of general surgery because it's a different specialty now. Right. Frank, you've never been one to shy away from difficult issues, particularly the issue of vascular surgery as a distinct specialty. You, Jim Stanley, and many others, including me, fought for independence for years. Mm -hmm. Many felt that vascular surgery was just as clearly a distinct en entity as neurosurgery or cardiothoracic or orthopedics. And yet, in the final analysis, independence was denied by the American Board of Medical Specialists. Why? Was this purely political, Frank? Uh, yes. I don't know. It was, maybe it was economic as well as political. Uh, but it, it clearly was, um, was certainly political. And because we fulfilled all the necessary criteria in the bylaws of the ABMS to have an independent board. And the, and the application, which was a two feet tall, um, basically documented that. Um, but we were told during the process that we shouldn't bother applying mm -hmm. because it would be denied. And then after we were denied and appealed it, we were told that we, our appeal would be denied. And yet, when we, um, and we actually, actually tried to lobby Congress to support us because we felt this was in the interest of patient well-being. And when some of the individuals in Congress called the American Board of Medical Specialties and asked why we were turned down, the answer was, and I was sitting in the room on a speakerphone listening, um, the answer was, we don't know, we don't keep records. Yeah. That, I'd say that's political. I'd have to. Yeah. But do you believe that this forced the American board and others to make significant changes that were in our favor? We got some booby prizes. Okay. Uh, we got some compensatory um, things given to us, one of them being the Zero and Five program, right. which right. was beneficial. And we had something called the primary certificate, which was... Um, a token that maybe made us a little more independent, but still didn't make us uh, a fully independent specialty. And my belief today is that though our training has been improved 
remarkably by our effort and will continue to improve because it's the right thing to do um, with more and more zero and five programs being uh, coming into being I think one of the reasons that we're uh, that I'm disappointed or that our specialty should be disappointed is that administratively we're yeah. still regarded as a subordinate subspecialty and in many institutions, medical schools, and uh, hospitals, not all, vascular surgery has to go through an administrative structure which is comprised of general surgery or cardiac surgery. In other words, they're subordinate right. to that administrative structure. So we don't have necessarily, oftentimes, in some institutions, not all, we don't have a seat at the table. No, we don't. And so that we're not equal we're not playing on a level playing field and right. um, as a result vascular surgery can't um, develop and evolve and prosper to the extent that it think it deserves to prosper. Let's talk about the V Symposium which has been going on for how many years now Frank? Uh, 30 we just finished the 39th annual meeting wow. and, and it, it wasn't always the name evolved, and it's not my name, it's an acronym, uh, Vascular Endovascular Interventional Therapy but Horizons. This, is all, this has always been your meeting, Frank, even though when it was called... Well, the, the no, no, it, it, it was originally called Critical Issues in Vascular Surgery. I know, but, but this was, the driving force has always been you, you behind well, it. Well, Henry Hamavici started the meeting before I did. I think he had three or four meetings before I took it over. Um, and it was a small meeting. It had maybe 100 or 200 people, 10 or 15 faculty, um, and, but it's grown progressively over the years, uh, in part due to good fortune and in part, hopefully, due to some good management. How many people attended this year? We had close to 4,400. I, wow. I use the figure that I think. Now, not everybody was a paying doctor, but the, the total attendance was 4,400. Amazing. This is certainly the largest and most respected educational meeting for vascular surgery worldwide. <clears throat> the innovations, which have been many in this symposium, have included the short five-minute presentation. How did you, how did you make right. this happen, Frank, without a revolt of all the pre well, presenters. Well, it, it wasn't easy, but it was, it was in, in some ways good luck. I, I wanted to have more faculty because people had good things to say, and I couldn't get them into a compressed enough period without making the talks very short, so they got shorter and shorter. They're not really six, they're six minutes, not five. Oh. Um, mm. they're, they're given five minutes, but there's a minute that they can run over a little bit, and... Um, and, and for transition. So they, they can keep talking a little longer than five minutes, and most of us do. Most of them do. It's very hard to give a five-minute talk. It takes a lot of work, but it works. And as long as you enforce it for everybody, they accept it. And that way I can get two or three talks in for one person on if they have two or three good ones. And the, the other thing that prompted me to do it, if you watch a television interview, with say Henry Kissinger, he doesn't get more than two or three minutes of talk time, and yet he gets his points across, and and so people have gotten good at at getting it across in the allotted time. And the, the real secret, which again I stumbled into, is having a clock on the screen, so that the <laughs> the speaker sees it, as well as everybody else. They don't want to talk over. It's just but if you just put a clock somewhere off to the side, nobody looks at it. They're always, they're looking at their slides. So by putting the time on the slide, he has to look at it. He, he can pace himself, and he knows that if he goes over the five and a half minutes, the slides will go off. So he finishes, and it, it works. It, it, it's effortless. It used to be tremendous effort on my part. I used to have to go up there and tap him on the shoulder and then pull him off and, you know, jokingly put my hand over the microphone, but now it's it's automatic. It works. It really and, does. and yet there, there are disadvantages. I mean, some people would like to hear more, but then you can't get as much in. And and 
in general, a lot of what you give when you give a 10-minute or 15-minute talk is background. It's un unnecessary. Right. The Sharing Cross meeting was certainly pat patterned after your symposium. I'm, I'm not sure that Roger would agree with that. He'd say ours is patterned after his. No, I interviewed him oh, uh, a few okay. weeks ago, and it's clear that th that meeting was patterned after yours. Do you think that the Sharing Cross is the EU version of the V Symposium? Yeah, I do. I think it's a good meeting. They have a lot of attendees. They get some people that we don't get. Um, I, I basically, I learn from every meeting I go to. I, I don't have that many original ideas. They either evolve through accident or, or some like the five-minute talk, or um, I learn from somebody else, and they learn from me. So it's a natural evolution. The trick is to come up with something new every year and, and have it be positive, um, and that's not easy. I mean, every year it's like I say to my colleagues, it's like winning the Super Bowl. You win one year, you have a good year, n people like the meeting and so forth, you've got to repeat it the next year. So it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Not many teams win the Super Bowl two years in a row. What is your measure of success? Is it attendance or is it ideas or how can you measure? How do you know when you're doing well? Well, attendance is one. Satisfaction of industry. Mm -hmm. they, they, and they, they need access to the, to the doctors. It's one of the reasons Obamacare is so bad that it's trying to separate industry from doctors. That's mm -hmm. a terrible thing. That, that, that does more harm to health care than you can imagine. I mean, yes. it, it's like separating... Uh, Wives from husbands. I mean, it's it, hard to have children that way. But anyhow, the, the, um, I, we, we are partners with industry. Our ideas, they take to fruition. They have the money and the engineering expertise. We'd be dead in the water without it. And similarly, they'd be dead in the water if they couldn't get ideas from us. And there's nothing wrong with marketing their, their goods to us because... That's what their business is about. Now, dishonest marketing, that's a bad thing. But we, we try very hard, if somebody is giving a positive view on, on one um, device or graft, we try and get somebody to give the opposite view so that the audience can make up their own mind. And um, so I think success is measured in number of people who come, how the people like it. Um, whether they come back the next year, whether industry feels that they're getting um, what they need out of the meeting in terms of honest marketing, um, and how good the talks are. Right. Um, well, it's a tremendous meeting. I'd like to now move to a, a series of opinion questions that are somewhat okay. brief, but uh, just your, your personal opinion. The merge of SVS and ISCVS, you think that was harmful as far as international exchange? No, I don't think so. But I, international exchange is very important. But I don't think the role of the SVS is to be an international society. Uh, I think other international societies should be international societies that, that may have different functions. The SVS in my opinion, should represent the needs uh, and requirements of North American vascular surgeons. And it should have political um, overtones or, or functions. It should have marketing functions. It should have educational functions, even social functions. But it should be the voice of North American vascular surgery, and particularly U.S. vascular surgery. Now, that isn't to say they shouldn't have international members and that there shouldn't be cross-circulation um, and, and, and cross-stimulation, but we, basically the SVS should serve the needs of American vascular surgeons. Do you see a place for SVS sponsoring exchange and traveling fellowships? Sure. Nothing wrong with that. Okay. Now, <clears throat> to a real hot potato, U.S. health care, as we all know, this has become a real political football that may be fumbled many, many times in the future. Frank, do you think we've lost our way? Yes, but I hope I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
What is your favorite operation? I like carotid endarterectomy because it was quick, it was fa fairly simple, but I got the most satisfaction out of doing difficult aneurysms or distal bypasses. But uh, they weren't my favorite because they were too hard. Very difficult. Mm -hmm. What is your advice now to young vascular surgeons? Uh, get the best training you can. Um, and um, try not to be uh, wooed by the economic pressures that are going to increase as time goes on. Marry, you, marry a rich woman so you don't have to worry about making a <laughs> living. What should you be influenced by? Should not me or, or the young guy? The young guy. I guess doing the best thing he can do for his patients, getting people well, well the young that woman. nobody else can get well and not doing unnecessary procedures, which unfortunately the financial um, pressures are really very tempting to do unnecessary procedures. Frank, thank you for this excellent interview okay. and for your time.